but let me share the screen. Just so you know, if you only speak Spanish or you understand better Spanish, I put in red a, a short summary uh, in uh, on every page. The red is for, is Spanish and the blue is French. Um, je, um, <laughs> tengo un resumen en, en um, rojo para los habladores de español. Um, J'ai un uh, résumé en français, en bleu. And forgive my mistakes. Okay, the fall of literary theory, that's the main uh, thing I'm going to talk about. Is the book from 2017. And I have been fascinated by how identity is informed by language, culture, and society's power games to the point that we humans have convinced ourselves that we are imperfect and that we, if we don't read ourselves of imperfections, we deserve to suffer. So you will see this across cultures, right? Um, this idea that you have to become perfect or you used to be and, and you lost it somehow and it's your fault or it's our culture's fault. Even more, we have our uh, made our perceived flawed human nature the justification for making others suffer. This book is my attempt at explaining with the help of some of the above mentioned theories, why we see ourselves as fallen and showing how destructive this identity perception is. So this book is my attempt to, to make theory relevant again, and it's in a transdisciplinary way because it, it explores many, many layers of our um, identity formation. So theory, the fall of theory, why do I call it a fall? I don't really think it's fallen but it's a play on the word fall. Contrary to popular, popular belief, theory has not gone anywhere. It has not fallen and the mechanism by which it questions our society is still in place, maybe incomprehensible, sorry, maybe not quite as vocal as in the past. And some have declared theory useless and comprehensible, relativistic, snobbish, and ultimately dead. Aside from its impact on scholarship, theory is still a great influence in politics and culture. With the use of some aspects of deconstruction and post-structuralism, I have developed an analysis of identity, which I see as a construct that has changed the time. And I follow these changes as they reflect in American literature of a few different time periods. I see theory as a tool for diagnosing identity issues, not for defining or redefining identity. So let's take a diagnosis. Uh, the first step in healing identity, which is my purpose, is to try to find a way to not um, for identity not to harm us so much. Uh, so the first step is uh, accepting that we are much too used to constructing it in destructive ways and try to analyze why that happens. So fallenness, a term that I use a lot, um, in order to make sense of why there are so many issues with identity, as soon as we attempt to understand it, I use the concept that I call fallenness. We can only counter the violence of our fall whether it's seen as origin as a, or, uh, or as corruption of origin, if we acknowledge the reasons why we see ourselves and others as fallen, if we push out of our language this concept of fallen identity, then we can begin to heal and communicate with one another in a more constructive way, culturally, nationally, politically, personally, etc. The violent beginning of the 21st century with terrorism, war, destructive conspiracy theories, and now the devices, divisive pandemic, has made many call for a return to metaphysical center and for the rejection of globalization. You hear this all the time. In the age of diversity, traditional Western values became exposed as constructed, even arbitrary. So it is comforting to seek a new center and a new empire. Empires are always built on identities that are placed on the top of a pyramid. So the, to the detriment of others, which are perceived as flawed or fallen from grace. Every time a group identifies with a space of power, a new justification is given for violence toward other fallen identities. A recent event in the US is a convenient metaphor for this. If you've heard of this um, cake maker who refused to give, make a cake for a gay couple who was getting married. So the gay couple will not get cake at the cake shop for their wedding because they're fallen, even if they're accepted by law, because they have abandoned mainstream social norms 
even if gay marriage is now legal. It's not hard to find new discourses of power and identity today. And after we witnessed the rise of, tr of Trumpism as an umbrella term for return of all identity tropes, such as racial, political, national, in the United States, Europe, and elsewhere. So ter um, territory identity and fallenness, I, my biggest concern is that identity, why am, am I criticizing the identity um, concept? Because it's always identified with the territory. And territory means fighting, defending, competing. So one of the reasons why identity is a thorny issue and why it's still commonplace to, to see killings performed in the name of an identity is that identity is a territory and territories need to be kept intact, whole, pure, and corrupted. Moreover, territories need to be expanded. So in order to validate what one's identity, the self-identical needs to gain more converts to that identity. At the beginning of human societies, territory was literal land and its resources to be defended from other tribes and not other nations. To this day, people want to build walls to protect integrity of a territory such as US with Mexico, where many want to build a wall. And if you look deeper into it, it's a lot of that um, momentum comes from trying to protect white identity from, you know, if more Mexican people come or more Latino people come, then white people are gonna become a minority. That's what people Years, so they put a wall for their identity to be protected. That is why violence of identity extends to any violence that is in the name of, and most violence is attached to a concept. For example, killing in the name of freedom, God, the party. Why is our ident identity connected to a territory? Because we're born into language and we acquire identity within language. And we have ascribed signification to all of our possessions, physical ones such as land, house, car, wife, husband, children, or abstract freedom, tradition, faith, cross, holy book, church, temple, etc. We will kill for any of these territories because their loss threatens our identity. And I identified three kinds of falling or identity defined as fallen. So this is my categorization. Uh, first one is um, the emphasis on social identity to which the individual has to sacrifice either an object, which can be abstract or other individuals to acquire identity. The sacrifice can be explained as the mythical fall from or and toward innocence. This identity is typical for totalitarian societies or for repressed societies where individuals are afraid to be different from the norm. The state is more important than the individuals. The second one, <clears throat> the emphasis is on the emphasis on individual identity to which something from the social um, system or the connection to the community as a whole is sacrificed for the sake of authentic personalized identity. So you give up social self in order to acquire personal identity, authentic identity. So it's a fall from and toward authenticity. This identity is typical for periods of revolution and rebellion when individuality is praised more than the state. Then three, uh, the third one is the emphasis on non-identity, which was popular with postmodernism. So to which social and individual meaning are sacrificed for the sake of the negative of identity explained as a fall from and toward a different kind of meaning. So the search for meaning is prevalent in post the postmodern age. This is or was the case in post the postmodern period or any age of relativism or chaotic transition when people distrust any assigned identity and look for new ways to find an identity. And now I have some examples and um, hopefully this is what um, the biggest part of the book is. It's a practical application to see in literature this reflection of how the fall from an identity or identity defined as a fall from something can be destructive. That's my purpose in showing some examples from literature. So the fall from innocence, um, the mythical social identity relies on a notion that there's a perfect society that needs to be recreated on earth, shaped after in it, its initial lost model, which is a utopian model. We could say that this identity mode is based on three assumptions, that the ideal identity existed in the past, that was lost at some point due to an impurity interfering with the social or mythical world, and that this identity is retrievable. And I don't want to go into that, but it's 
rings in my head, make America great again. Anyway, um, in other words, what has been lost in the fall from a perfect world can be brought back into actuality if only the imperfections or corrupting elements in the social system can be eliminated. Example, Socrates, Christ, or a revolutionary will accept to die in order to assert the communal pure identity. See Rousseau's discussion of the social contract and the promise of perfection. For the same purpose, the other has to be neutralized or eliminated, even if it's identified in oneself. So it could be self-destructive too. And my literary example is Billy Bob Sailor by Herman Melville. And if you're not um, if you're not familiar with it, very short summary, Billy Bob, an innocent sailor, accidentally kills a superior officer uh, when fa falsely accused of mutiny. Captain Veer feels compelled to execute Billy Bob in order to maintain order on the ship. Billy Bob shows how dangerous it is to become, it has become, or it can become, sorry, to maintain at all costs the boundaries of the law when faced with impurities. These impurities in the Derridian sense can be anything that threat, threatens to expose the law as an arbitrary game. Captain Veer's position as defender of social identity creates a situation in which Billy Budd both represents and dies in the name of innocence seen as identity. And now to use this um, the deconstructive theory, which makes it a, an interesting linguistic discussion, uh, Veer sees Billy as a son, uh, and like the biblical Abraham, he's asked to sacrifice his son to language, to the symbolic and arbitrary system that gives him Veer his power, and without which the whole ship would fall into chaos. Chaos. According to Derrida, language is a play of the metaphor of the father and the heir and son. Language is father, God, writing is son or signifier. The prodigal son needs to return to the father in order to affirm his and his father's identities. So Billy, i.e. writing, separated from the original signifier, has to return to signification, i.e. language, identity, the father, and he can only do so, do that by destroying, sorry, by letting himself be destroyed in order to assert or validate signification. Thus, arbitrary power is reasserted through violence. So Billy Budd, when he dies, he, he says, God bless Captain Veer. So that's my first example. Second example of fall from authenticity. So first to explain that fall from authenticity, it is a fall inward in the space where the meaning that is corrupted by the outside world can be still retrieved. The shift inwards follows historically as a reaction to the oppressiveness of a social system and attack by individuals um, who feel rejected or inadequate, such as Milton Satan. To come to terms with themselves and still see themselves as redeemable, these individuals tried either to revolutionize the social order, such as French Revolution and the end of European feudalism, or to re retreat from the social system into the space of their individual selves, such as the Romantics and the Modernists. My example is the Faulkner book, William Faulkner, uh, Absalom, Absalom. And just a couple words about um, why the, I picked this. So the uh, American dream, as, as Faulkner sees this, was built on the idea that it is possible to create a new system where the, exception and the exceptional individual would be able to assert superiority and rearrange the traditional hierarchies of the old world. So this was America. And, Faulkner sees that enhanced in the South. In Absalom Absalom, a poor white character, Sutton attempts to take revenge on a social uh, society that rejects him by forcing his way to the top. His plan is to, cre to create a dynasty, but the plan fails because his wife has black blood. He remarries and has a son and daughter. The son has left behind, he left behind, which is Charles Bond, tries to force him to recognize him as a son by courting his half-sister. When Sutton refuses this recognition, the younger son, Henry, is forced to kill his brother to stop an incestuous marriage. So that's the plot. Sutton's Nietzschean audacity to create himself out of nothing and to assume godlike power of creation over his own offspring ends in disaster, of course, <laughs> to expect. His struggle to become an unfallen individual free of social constraints brings him back into the social system. The quest for individual identity at the expense of others leads to solipsism, which absorbs the individual in the search for his lost authentic self. So he destroys himself and everybody else around him. And my third mode, uh, the fall from meaning is, um, so the third mode 
functions by denying that identity is a stake and showing that it is a social construct. Deconstructive criticism of the media, for example, shows, for example, fashion is language, tricking us into believing a certain brand gives us identity. This type of fall shakes the foundation of meaning or truth. The emphasis, emphasis is on identity sorry, the emphasis on identity and meaning is missing, creates the need for new meaning and new identity. Many critics may find deconstruction frustrating because it refuses to offer new meaning. For Derrida, however, the questioning of identity itself is the point, not another identity. So the, the novel I picked to, as an example is Thomas Pynchon's uh, The Crying of Lot 49, where just brief plot, Edipa Mas, the main character of this novel, is marked by her search for identity in a world of meaninglessness. Very typical post postmodern book, given some clues that lead her to a secret so society that functioned for centuries, tries to find the truth but doesn't, of course. Edipa is caught in a world of science that signify the failure of both the social and the individual realms to provide the stability of identity. Her obsessive search through language for something that would counter the effects of language leads her back to uh, back into the fold of, of language. So her search for meaning fails. Just as in the other two texts, when something is perceived that has having been lost, the mere fact of it having existed justifies going to any length in attempting to retrieve it. Many critics such as Baudrillard, Jean, Jean Baudrillard, notes that the real has disappeared behind signs in the modern world, cybernetic bodies, artificial means of communication, etc. Yet Pynchon goes to some length to show us that there is no point in looking for that real because we can only uncover the arbitrariness of the world, the emperor being naked, or the world as a game of signification. So as a conclusion, I try to offer some ways to heal identity. So if identity has fallen is so destructive, what do we do? <laughs> but this is identi identity, we always see, is, see it as perfectable because it's fallen. So what do we do? Rather than venture to claim that there is no such thing as identity, it's more important to find a way to deal with the very real effects of how we have defended, defined our identity. It's important to recognize that even though the identities that we bring forward in our interactions may not be real, we still function and relate to each other as if we had real identities. The causes that have produced us are still at work and will always be at work in different ways. And we can understand and engage with them so they can stop being a burden. There are two important steps toward healing ourselves from identity obsession. First, understanding why the notion of fall or identity has fallen is damaging. And second, stepping beyond the fall and towards others who themselves are effects of their own ident identities. In other words, we can attempt to reconnect or to connect or reconnect to others better if we stop looking for a non-existent pure identity. Ethical approaches to otherness in a, is an evolving field. Satya Mahanti, My, Michael Himes Garcia, Emmanuel Levinas to an extent, and Derrida try to find ways to reconcile with the arbitrary nature of identity. One way to move forward is to see identity as always becoming uh, rather than trying to go back to one we felt from. An example of and I have two short examples, very short examples of unfallen identity. One is the novel Tortuga by Rodolfo Anaya, where the hospital full of children with various broken identities becomes a place of healing. In the end, the children accept themselves and each other, forging a healing community made of imperfect identities. And another example is the novel Beloved by Toni Morrison, where the painful past of slavery is healed when relationality takes the place of identity and each character becomes a healer for the others. So just a beginning of trying to seek identity, different, more relational rather than self-identical and unfallen or try to retrieve what has fall, we fell from. I know it's kind of a mouthful, but this is my presentation. Let me stop sharing. I don't want to mess up and close everything, but this is um, how do okay. I stop? Stop! Oh, okay, stop! Share. I think I did it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liana.